Right, let's talk about the structure then to sort of round things off, really, because uh, it's an interesting move. I sort of said before, Andy, that they maybe had to do this because of like, the, the, the lack of time and the lack of sort of space between these matches in the immediate circumstance. But to, to spell out so clearly in the statement that Michael Carrick was in charge for the forthcoming matches, he's the caretaker until the, the, an official interim manager is in charge between that point and the end of the season. Then, of course, with the inference that a permanent manager would then be appointed in the summer. I mean, this is a very unusual thing to sort of set your stall out doing, isn't it? Yeah, and it could lead to several soap operas where you don't just have who will Manchester United's next manager be. It's it's a never-ending story. Who's the interim boss going to be? Yeah. And then what if the interim boss does really well like Oli Gunnar did? Well, at the minute, and... it seems clearer who the potential permanent manager could be in sort of like six months' time than who the interim manager could be at maybe the end of the week. Yeah, it does. And I do not know the answer to that question. All I do know was with the cultural reboot at Manchester United, uh, this was supposed to be that there was a proper organisation in place to prevent things like this happening. But it seems like the club have been completely uh, caught out by it. So... I've done a piece for the Athletic on who the next manager could or should be and who those interim candidates are. But this is a fast-moving situation. I don't think, as we speak now on the Monday, that the decision has been made. I do know, as I said, that the club have been taking calls and will be going through the various candidates. And then who makes that decision? Well, you've got a football committee, if you like, and they they would vote on, on players and they're going to be voting on the interim manager. But then... You know, you're voting for who's going to be your new boss, thinking, do I like this person? Oh, I've actually I fell out with him seven years ago. You know, there's all sorts of conflicts and it is an unholy mess at the moment. How long's Carrick in charge for, Laurie? Th- th- nobody knows. I don't think he knows. You know, there were some reports that everyone had been you know, sacked and, and they were erroneous. You know, it was only El Gunnar Solskjaer, but even the coaches only found out, um, you know, on Sunday morning. Uh, once they got to Carrington, Edward Wood took control of that situation, which is right because he is, you know, the head of the football kind of structure um, at the moment, and he absolutely owned the Ole Gunnar Solskjaer appointment and the continued backing of him. So therefore, he should be the one to, you know, tell him to his face. Yeah, that's it. Time's up. But I do have a concern that he is now also in charge of picking the interim or even the next permanent manager. Wasn't he supposed to step down? You know, because he couldn't back the Super League proposals, or there was some kind of, you know, um, shame in the fact that he was a conspirator to that event. And now it seems like actually he is going to hang around, and there's some consultancy role that's being talked about that I think is very uh, possible. And it makes me think that actually the whole resignation thing was either ill thought out or was a kind of smokescreen to distract from the actual eventuality that he still is there and calling the shots. And he hasn't got it right repeatedly so I don't know why he would still be in place um, so that concerned me because I would say that you've created a structure where you've got a technical director and a football director in Darren Fletcher and John Murter but are they actually given the authority to go and make those decisions they obviously both know football John Murter has been a, a football administrator for a number of years Darren Fletcher obviously a player and there is a an interesting dynamic with Fletcher in terms of you know he does the um, the, the warm-ups uh, he's on the bench um, he trains with the team so that's a lot of people are saying to me that is a, a very unusual you know they, they've never heard of a technical director do those kind of things so there needs to be clarity there needs to be genuine authority given to people in positions to then go and do their jobs properly and that is why I think I'm still uncertain as to whether United then pick you know, the right person um, to, to come in I mean me and Andy can kind of bat around a few names I guess your, your piece was, was really interesting Andy um, I mean, Ralph Rangnick is one that I'd heard that United like, John Murta particularly. Um, I think he's done work with him in the past. Um, and, you know, he's at Locomotive Moscow right now. He went there in the summer, so it's only a recent thing. So you've got that to kind of get your head around. Would he come only on this interim basis? Um, would anyone come only on an interim basis? That's, as you say, Ian, it's weird that they've kind of announced this. Um, you know, would they want guarantees of a position beyond that point? Um, but I think Ralph Rangnick would at least be absolutely dripping in football knowledge um, who has 
you know, been a key part of, of the German wave of, of, of managers and head coaches. So I think he'd be a really interesting appointment. Um, we'd heard a little bit of um, whether Laurent Blanc had a, had a shout. He's over in um, Qatar at the moment. Um, he was obviously spoken to before Ole Gunnar Solskjaer got the job on a caretaker basis, was sort of one of the candidates in that situation, but he hasn't managed at a high level for a number of years. So there's, there's sort of, you know, again, doubts about him. Um, I mean, listen, longer term, as you've alluded to, Ian, the, the Mauricio Pochettino shadow looms large. Edward Woods obviously um, you know, knows all about him. Sir Alex Ferguson um, is a, a key um, you know, ally, I suppose. He, he has great admiration for Mauricio Pochettino. Right now, he's in charge of PSG and he's, it's difficult to get people out of PSG if PSG don't want you to leave. And we do hear... The, the story seems to be, though, at the minute, Laurie, that he'd be interested in taking over straight away. So th if that is a doable situation for Manchester United does that change everything that was said in the statement did they just go and get Poch simple as that well I think yeah I think the statement is obviously one that they've kind of done as a, a bit of a placeholder so yeah it, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that that is absolutely guaranteed to happen so yeah plans can change um, but I'd still you know people that I've spoken to about it just think that getting him out of PSG would be very difficult um, so you know maybe United already know that um, whatever Pochettino's you know, preferences might be and, and we have to say you know Pochettino might come out and say actually I'm very happy here you know but equally you know the, the sort of noises we hear are that actually he would be open to a Premier League return and Manchester United clearly is a huge carrot for him he's, he's been very interested in the job in the past so why would he not now but um, I don't know Andy if you've heard different additional information yeah well in, in addition to that um, Zidane's name was always put forward I had no evidence that he wanted to manage in England I don't know him but I know people who do know him. Um, I've always liked Luis Enrique. I do know him. And I know that at times he's wanted to manage in England, but I'm also told he's very happy managing the Spanish national team. Uh, there are other names mentioned in the piece for the interim role. Uh, one name I mentioned was Rudy Garcia, who was um, last in charge of, of, of Leon. If I pick out two matches which I've seen in the last few years, apart from Man United, which have really made me go, wow. It was Ajax beating Real Madrid in the Bernabeu. Um, managed by um, Eric Ten Hag. And I remember before that game speaking to the Ajax journalists and they said, yeah, he's, his job's under pressure. We think he's going to lose his job. And then after that game, so it just shows you, doesn't it? You know, you get all these like, um, these consensus of opinions now. I've got the quotes which I took before that match of people who follow Ajax every single week. He's a poor communicator. We want to go back to how we were. And I've also got his quotes from after that game that was close to perfect, which it was. So his stock has gone up and up. And then the other game was when Leon beat Manchester City with um, a midfield of three nine-year-olds. And again, I was there. And I was like, whoa, where does this come from? And then I spoke to the manager, um, Rudy Garcia. He'd done really well with um, Lille, led them to the double, brought through Eden Hazard, helped develop those young players at at Leon, um, Memphis, Depay. But what he has done is he's gone into troubled, struggling big clubs like Roma, where everybody says you're going to have loads of problems with Totti and De Rossi. He got them on side straight away. He speaks five languages, including English. He went into Marseille when they were 15, took them right up the table into the Europa League um, final. So that's an another name who would absolutely be interested in, in M M Manchester United. It's a very, very attractive job for a lot of football managers. It's just the timing that's awkward because most of the best managers uh, are in employment because they're the best managers. You look like you're quite interested in Rudy Garcia there, Ian. Who, who, would, you, uh, who would you go for? Go well, the on. more Andy was talking... Yo, Ed Woodward for a day. Yeah, the more Andy was talking about him, he seemed more and more appealing with every sentence that he went through. I just think United have to try their very best to get this right because like we've been talking throughout this podcast, it just seems to be getting messier and messier as each decision's made. We're not only talking now about the sort of manager's position and sorting that out. We're talking about sorting out the manager's position right now, then the interim basis, then at the end of the season. Beyond that, we're then saying, is the structure right above? Who's making the decisions? Is the executive vice chairman going to be the executive vice chairman much longer? Are the football administrators who were brought in, are they actually having a say on things that are happening on the football side of things? Just all of it doesn't seem to be as clear as it needs to be. And, and, I can't remember who said it and which player they were referring to, but players usually just want 
certainty. They, they want structure. They want stability. They want to know who the manager is. They want to know who's in the team. They want to know which players are playing week to week, what style we're playing. And none of this really seems to feed into that idea that United are stable at the moment and, and the team. Is that then giving the team the best opportunity to be a success, not only in the match, you know, tomorrow at Villarreal, but beyond that and and long term as well. So I think it's just a situation now that they can't afford to make messier. It has to get more straightforward from this point. Uh, we will talk more, no doubt whatsoever, about the manager's position, both short term and long term, on Thursday's Talk of the Devils.